Iran's attack on Israel has raised questions over its military capabilities and its potential readiness for an escalated conflict in the region. The country, which has been under international sanctions for years, has been suffering from high inflation and low growth. But over the past few months, it's also been showing increasing readiness to flex its military muscles, carrying out attacks on tankers near the Strait of Hormuz and reinforcing its support for a range of militant groups, including Hamas and Hezbollah. To talk more about this, I'm joined now by Javaid Salehi Isfahani, Professor of Economics at Virginia Tech and an expert in Middle East econ economics. Javad, perhaps we could begin by looking at the economic backdrop to this latest escalation. What state is the Iranian economy in right now and how ready is it for a potential military escalation with Israel? Well, generally it's not ready for uh, an extended military conflict which is why they have been very careful to not get too involved in the Gaza war. Uh, they, uh, the attack they had on Israel sounded more symbolic and one intended to do harm. Uh, inflation is very high and it's very sensitive to uh, tensions in the region. So just for the last two, three weeks when people have been expecting uh, tensions to rise, uh, the dollar has appreciated in value by about 15%. It's 25% up from a few months ago. And these inflationary, uh, the exchange rate devaluation very quickly translates into uh, higher prices because Iran imports a lot of types of commodities and many of the commodities it produces inside Iran also have an import comp component. So uh, I think the country is bracing for higher inflation at this moment. Uh, last year, uh, which ended on 21st uh, of March, registered inflation of 40%, uh, and it has been higher than that before. And I, my expectation is that this new round of tensions and the devaluation is going to at least keep the inflation that high, if not raise it some more. Uh, Iran is uh, not self-sufficient in food, so uh, any shock to world prices or any shock to the ability to import food uh, is going to raise food prices, which is going to have a big impact on the welfare of the poor, because food uh, occupies some half of their expenditures. Uh, Right. I want to learn a little bit more about how Iran's economy works. It is largely controlled by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. They manage everything from oil and banking to healthcare. even. What is the impact of essentially having the armed forces in charge of the economy? Well, I wouldn't say the armed forces are in charge of the economy. I think people exaggerate sometimes the influence of the guards. I don't think it's any more than in Egypt or Pakistan. Uh, when you have uh, an authoritarian state, the armed forces can operate with more freedom. And on top of that, because of sanctions, uh, the uh, power, economic power has shifted from private sector, especially the smaller producers, to bigger producers and from private sector to government entities uh, like the IRGC which has a big operation in terms of a building of dams, roads, uh, ports, and so on. And also uh, because of sanctions in uh, export of oil. You know, exporting oil and bringing the money back, given all the uh, restrictions on transfer of money, is very difficult. So you can't expect private traders to do that. And uh, it's the uh, revolutionary guards that control that. But there is still a very uh, uh, sizable private sector. The agricultural sector is uh, mostly uh, private uh, distribution. You know, the, maybe 80% of the population uh, or the working force is not working for the IRGC or for the government. So I think that's something that people uh, don't quite realize that as we speak now, Iran still is characterized as a market economy with a big influence from the state and the armed forces. 
That's an interesting correction. All right. We know that in the past, Iran has been carrying out a lot of its military activities by proxy, as well as the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. It also supports a range of militants in Syria and Iraq, as well as Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthi rebels in Yemen, for example. Together, these groups form a powerful network of anti-US and anti-Israel militants. Jafad, what portion of Iranian state spending goes into this kind of financial backing and what level of support for it is there among the Iranian people? That's a very good question, but also very difficult to answer. You know, these uh, financial transfers are obviously by nature hidden. The government doesn't publish any numbers. Uh, we do know that of the 50 to 70 billion dollars a year that Iran earns in terms of foreign exchange, a good deal of it goes to import of food and import of uh, other commodities, necessary commodities. And maybe about 10 billion is uh, exported through various means, uh, which we put under capital flight. Uh, so it's very hard to put a number on what uh, these uh, proxy forces cost Iran. But again, I suspect that uh, the media numbers exaggerate. Uh, Iran does whatever it does on the cheap. Uh, you know, working with who sees who sees doesn't take a whole lot of money. Uh, supplying uh, the uh, uh, Hamas with uh, military equipment or military know-how doesn't cost a whole money. Uh, I think Hezbollah at one point. Uh, either they declared or was in the news that they get $100 million a year. And if you think of $100 million compared to uh, 50 to $70 billion, which is my estimate of what Iran's earnings are in foreign exchange, is not, is not huge. Other, there are other countries who spend a lot more uh, in either foreign aid or foreign influence. Uh, I think a lot of Iran's uh, um, power, if you like, in... Uh, ha projecting its power outside comes from an ideological uh, source. The fact that it is, uh, especially now, uh, one of the very few countries that uh, openly supports uh, the Palestinian cause. Sure, let's return then to the issue of oil. It is, of course, by far the country's most important source of revenue, a commodity that is very vulnerable to geopolitical tensions. If we look at the past few years, we did see a steep decline in exports after the US pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal and reimposed sanctions in 2018. But in recent years, we have seen an uptick again, and that's mainly due to an increase in purchases from China, which have enabled Iran to maintain a positive trade balance. I'm wondering if you could give some insight into this. Oil prices did initially rise after the Iranian attack on Israel, but they've since stabilized again amid a lot of talk of de-escalation. To what extent is Iran factoring in its heavy dependence on oil as it assesses its next move? I'm sure they are uh, very uh, worried that if the war damages the infrastructure to export oil, that that would take... Uh, that would uh, hit a hard blow to the economy. I must say that your uh, chart was very, very good, very informative, you know, uh, especially the fact that Iran has been able to recover like 80% of its oil exports. And most people uh, attributed that to a softening of the sanctions uh, since Biden has been in power. Uh, Iran's economy, in fact, has been growing partly as a result of this increase in oil exports. Uh, not all of that increase in GDP, which is about 5% per year, uh, which is not bad compared to what's happening in the region overall after COVID, uh, not all of that has translated into uh, higher living standards by the population, because I think the government has been uh, building up its uh, military, has been uh, has a lot of expenditures. We do see in the GDP data a more vibrant economy than we see in uh, household expenditures for which we have data with a, a year of back. Uh, but if uh, there is any decrease in oil prices or in oil exports, that will have a, an impact similar to the tensions that have raised the exchange rate, uh, devalued the real Iranian currency, 
and it will again translate into inflation. And uh, then with some delay, it will affect people's living standards. We will see food prices rising, people buying less food. Uh, we look very carefully into the household budgets uh, in a book that we recently published uh, uh, on how sanctions work. And Iranian living standards are back to 20 years ago because of sanctions. Not the GDP, the GDP uh, is about the same level or maybe a couple of percent higher than that. But I would say that the economy is very uh, sensitive to any further declines. So uh, I don't know what is going to be the balance between tensions or military conflict reducing the oil output and raising the oil price. Clearly there's a place where you, do, you lose 20% of your uh, oil exports and prices go up by 20% and you come out even. But there's going to be a delay. Uh, oil that Iran sells now is going to be delivered in uh, two months, three months, and the money is probably going to come back a couple of months later. So uh, Iran is looking into a, uh, an economic shock, a negative economic shock, uh, if there is a military conflict. I want to talk to you about the role of China as well, because it is, of course, is the biggest buyer of Iranian oil. Talk to me about the importance of that relationship. Well, it's very important because what happened with sanctions is that Iran shifted its imports from Europe. Iran's economy has been very close, was very closely integrated into Western Europe. But uh, in the last decade, uh, Iran has slowly shifted its uh, connections, trade connections to, to the East, especially to China. Uh, China is able to uh, provide Iran with a variety of goods uh, that Iran needs. It hasn't been as active in investment, investing in Iran. There's been much talk, but not much action. So it can't help the economy grow, but it can buy the oil and send back commodities in exchange. Uh, Iran is also depending more and more on Chinese uh, political support globally. You know, uh, China was instrumental in getting Iran and Saudi Arabia together. That has been a big uh, boon for Iran's uh, diplomatic power. Uh, Iran was invited again by China into the uh, BRICS, uh, which is a uh, alliance of uh, semi-industrialized or emerging economies. And that has been a big uh, hope, uh, source of hope for Iran that getting out of the Western orbit, there's some other place to go. And that place is kind of vaguely defined by China, Russia, BRICS and others. Uh, we haven't seen actual influence or actually impact from that shift of alliance to China. All we have now is here's a big country that can buy the oil and can actually ship goods to Iran. But would it it, be in terms of generating economic growth, we're not sure. Would it be fair to say then that one effect of the American sanctions is actually to, to strengthen another regional bloc that it has no interest in strengthening? Yes, absolutely. I think that's, again, one of the messages that we, uh, uh, our, our book emphasizes. Not only there's a shift externally from the West to East and China and Russia in particular, but there's also a shift inside the Iran from private sector and the middle class to uh, big state authorities, including the IRGC. To that extent then, would you declare those American sanctions a success or a failure? Well, it, it definitely a failure if they wanted to create more moderate Iran, uh, which in some way was the ultimate aim of sanctions, to get Iran to behave uh, more to the liking of Western powers. And uh, Iran has defied that. Uh, although I must say uh, sanctions were very successful in doing their first job, which was to cripple Iran's economy, bring its growth to a halt and uh, hurt the ordinary Iranians uh, hoping that they would then put pressure on their own government to uh, moderate with respect to Western demands. That also has not happened. So there are uh, success points. Yes, U.S. 
it's got a big power. Uh, the dollar is the king. And if uh, you uh, defy the U.S., you better be ready uh, for economic contraction, economic crisis. But can that then translate into a country subjugated, being subjugated, you know, and uh, changing its policies? And that hasn't happened. If anything, I think Iran has become more aggressive, as uh, it was demonstrated just a few days ago with its uh, attack on Israel. You saw it. I want to talk about the larger ramifications of this conflict now and what it could mean for the global economy. The Strait of Hormuz in particular has become a real flashpoint in this conflict. Around a fifth of the world's oil passes through here. And in recent months, we've seen a number of attacks on vessels there. Just last weekend, Iran's Revolutionary Guards seized a cargo ship it said was linked to Israel. Javad, talk to me about the kind of disruption to global trade that could occur if Iran and the groups it backs were to step up their attacks in the Strait of Hormuz. Well, I suspect that Iran's greatest strength is in its own neighborhood. Uh, so uh, when push comes to shove, Iran may decide to close the uh, uh, Strait of Hormuz. It may decide to attack shipping uh, that is closer to the southern uh, uh, shore of Persian Gulf, uh, maybe even uh, attack its newfound uh, uh, allies in terms of Saudi Arabia and UAE. We don't know that, but uh, the closest target would be to cause a crisis in terms of oil exports, which would primarily hurt China uh, and maybe India, but not necessarily Western Europe or, or the US, which is now self-sufficient in oil. So there is some complex calculation that's going on there. I'm not sure Iranians will uh, would want to, uh, as first resort, uh, go to closing of the Strait of Hormuz. But then there are other groups uh, like the Houthis, uh, which have now enough technology to disrupt shipping in the Red Sea. They could do similar uh, disruptions in the Persian Gulf. So all in all, I think the region, which is on the cusp of becoming much more developed, the flow of oil money, is facing a kind of disruption that may um, delay its economic development by a decade. You mentioned that Iranian backing of some of these groups isn't as significant as we might assume. On that, I'm wondering then how much control they really do have over those activities. If the Houthis choose to carry out attacks and Iran isn't in favor of that, to, to what extent do they have power over that? Well, they are allies in many ways. Uh, and that means uh, just like Israel has quite a bit of independence from the U.S., uh, Houthis have independence from Iran, but they don't want to completely break relations. So if Iranians really want to say, we don't want any more uh, ships being hit, I'm sure the Houthis will agree. The only group that Iran has close alliance with, close relationship with, are, is the Hezbollah. Uh, you know, everybody knows that Hamas is a Sunni organization, that uh, has not, in times of crisis, been allied with Iran. Now they appear as allies, or recently they have, but uh, they always uh, side with the general Palestinians are more likely to, like they did with Saddam Hussein when he was uh, fighting Iran. So Iranians are aware uh, that besides the ideological anti-Israel, anti-US, uh, alliance they have with some of these groups, uh, the, only the Shia groups can be trusted with uh, reliance when the going gets tough. I'd love to end on a personal note. You grew up in Iran. I imagine you still have family and friends there. How are ordinary people faring amid this ongoing tension? Well, they are not faring well. In fact, uh, most of what our book is about is talking to various people, women, young people, uh, to find out how they uh, imagine their future. And one of the things that sanctions and these kind of tensions uh, tell young people is that the future is bleak. Uh, I think I don't blame them uh, to want to study more English so they can immigrate when they get an offer from a um, 
university either in the West or in India or Singapore or Malaysia, they pack their bags and leave. Uh, if the young people, especially the educated young people, cannot see a future for themselves in the country, the country has a, a lot of difficulties to grow uh, and to become a normal country. And I don't know if it's possible for Iranians to feel that way. They have the sanctions, they have the looming uh, regional conflict, if not war, but they also have on top of that a lot of social restrictions that the government of Iran imposes on people, especially women. So all of this together, uh, it's very hard to be optimistic about Iran uh, growing, becoming a kind of happier nation uh, for the time being. A real tragedy of lost potential there. Javad Salahi is Fahani Professor of Economics at Virginia Tech. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. My pleasure.